Hello and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy for management, engineering and practical professions more generally. My name is Andrei Pavlov and I'm a professor of strategy and performance here at the School of Management. And my name is Toby Thompson. I'm the studio director here in the Granville Turner Studios. My interest is in the philosophy of executive education coming from it from a continental philosophy uh, emphasis. And our guest today is uh, Professor Kashik Suturan, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Business, Cape Town University. Kashik, welcome. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Cranfield. I'm delighted to be with you in Toby. Kushik, can I start with a very general question? I know that um, you've been um, the director of the executive MBA program um, at the University of Cape Town uh, Graduate School of Business for 10 years. And I know that you've, you've managed to embed um, philosophy and deep thinking in general, reflective critical thinking in general throughout the entire MBA program. I've never seen this anywhere else. Um, this is, to me, this is absolutely unique. Can you tell us about uh, the history of this? How did this come about? How did you manage to do this? Um, and how does this work? Thank you, Andre. We're really appreciative of your recognition of it being unique. It all started in um, about 2011 or 2012. I was hired by uh, the then dean of the school, uh, Walter Bates, who was interested in me taking the program uh, into more of a lived complexity world. So, so Walter Bates, if you, if, you, if you know of any of his work, has been a complexity scholar, but um, really focused on more mathematical complexity. And, right. um, and he, he saw a strength of mine in understanding lived experience and being able to talk about it using philosophy. And um, I had already an established strength in systems thinking. And, and the EMBA here had a, a need for somebody to direct. I had already uh, had a strong systems thinking foundation, but it needed to be pushed in more and more in a direction of lived complexity. And, and that's how the journey began, uh, Andre. It, it started with him uh, making the request and me um, being delighted uh, to take the, the invitation and gradually, bit by bit, evolve the program. So, um, you know, it, it really, um, in every way, tries to um, bring about the experience of complexity, as well as um, helping the executives on the program cultivate some sort of agency. Um, talk talk more about this. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Um cultivating a sense of agency. I mean, surely they are executives. They come in believing that they have lots of agency. Yes, exactly, Andre. And it's, um, I mean, it's, it's always useful to set some doubt in their minds that, you know, that executive life um, isn't lived in a wave of alertness for anybody. And um, nor is, you know, any directive easily understood and executed unproblematically. So there are always challenges with translation, challenges with um, extents of uh, appreciating the, the full understanding. So the, the complexity and the dynamics of executive life have to be understood by them for these nuances because the, if anybody really appreciates the full complexity of an organization, it is executives charged with giving it direction. Absolutely, because they would have seen the limits of their agency, I suppose. Precisely, yeah, precisely. And I think, you know, um, um, you know, building the humility of, of the complexity they're working with and giving them agency that, well, things are complex and you can't really control for certain which ways they unfold, but you nevertheless can create directionality and um, foster some sense of directionality with the people you uh, are going along the journey with. And, and that does require giving them new language, you know, and um, 
and becoming curious about this complexity and the inability to you know, be linear and instrumental in every act of providing uh, direction in an organization mm. when you accept these assumptions. Mm. And what does that look like on the ground? Um, I mean, so for example, we have an executive MBA program here at Cranfield as well. Um, so I'm dying to know, you know, what what have you actually done in terms of the way this is woven into the uh, structure of the program or in the lectures or how does how does that work? Yeah, that's uh, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share it. It's it starts off by a, a careful design of the overall experience because to see the doubts of uh, linear, rational agency available all the time is quite unsettling for some people mm, because absolutely. you know um, we have to to do that with care, and I, and I think um, you know we consider that very well in the ways in which we we start building the the total skill set. So we you know in, we kind of see it in five transition movements really. So the first is really to have them appreciate organizational life as this ongoing moving picture where they can think about effects coming together over time to produce some kind of emergence and being able to model that and appreciating that these models they build are some ways of providing structure, agency, and bringing some collaborative effort to move in that direction. Mm. So we commonly call that boundary objects, you know, in um, in any of the work when you produce these artifacts. So we start them off with um, being able to model complexity, being able to work with designing interventions with, with some realization of the full complexity and building lenses, you know, to to understand the complexity they're working with and, and produce interventions in that context. And then we gradually move on and say, well, um, how do we now think about organizing in this context? What could be a couple of big moving systems that are coming together to produce a sense of organization that's felt? So then we, you know, we we give them um, some understandings that organizations can be seen as complex adaptive systems. And, and here are some ways of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. and, and with those two foundations in place, then we move on to um, giving them an appreciation of well, how does strategic directionality get fostered in a complex adaptive system? What is your, um, what kind of ontology or view of the world should you have mm -hmm. to think about strategy in, in such complexity? And um, we have a process of them building their own theories of strategy, given under several understandings of strategy and, and seeing strategy as, as really uh, the introduction of a system that's trying to steer a pattern of action to produce directionality. And, you know, when we've really built up some appreciation of doing strategy in this way, and it being an ongoing accomplishment, mm -hmm. uh, so it's both a thing and a process in some sense. Right. Then we, we can, you know, we then move them forward and say, well, how do we understand the nucleus of the sets of choices you made as a uh, a set of norms, a set know, of to norms. provide, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. like you know, um, drawing on uh, norms um, that you would use to change a culture, where you talk about grounding norms, and, you know, giving people a sense of what's actually going on here in a general way, and clarifying norms about well, how should we act. What should we do? And then organizing norms, which is really the design of the business model, helps to experience those two intensely. And the organizing really tries to produce that intense experience of living those norms. Oh. And, uh, 
Because she can I final conversation? Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I'll just finish that, Joe, and we, we can pick up. A, so the final conversation from from that point is about leadership. Well, if we designing action in this manner in a system we're living in, what does leadership look like? And that's really what I've tried to write about in my recent book. I want to come on to so that. That's book. in a way which we we've 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 kind of levered up this full philosophical understanding in bite-sized doses. You don't seem shy of language here, philosophy, and some of the words we've talked about already are quite complex. Let's rewind though. Tell us more about the audience. Who are you talking to here? So, so typically we, we're talking to uh, anyone who's in a kind of management or leadership position who's 30 years and above, going right up to 65, I suspect, um, one of our older students here. And generally the average age is about 44. Okay. So they are okay. evenly balanced with males and females, about 50%. Uh, of the proportion of the class are made up uh, is quite a, and mostly executives from the African continent. Mm. And how big is the cohort? The the current size is sixty, near okay. about okay sixty to sixty five. Yeah. Tell us more about whether you feel you need to Koshek, disguise philosophy. Do you actually use the word philosophy, or do you call it critical thinking? Or, or something like analysis of some sort? How do you approach this philosophical topic to them? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. So we start off framing, well, how do human beings become better human beings? You know, what is it about character development that makes it such a puzzle to engage with? So we see the early philosophical ideas around character development and being, you know, trying to really cultivate some sense of um, understanding and experience of being and having a language for that. So we, we, we you know, from, from the get-go, I think we, we, we give them some, um, you know, um, I wouldn't say downplayed, but some interpreted Heidegger so, you know, written in, in what we call work in progress papers to give them understandings of everydayness, as an example, mm. or authenticity. And so, I mean, we, we start out from the get-go, I'd say. Can I follow up on this? I don't uh, unless you have a no, follow-up question, ahead. Toby. Um, this is really interesting, Koshik, because what do you think gives you the, I suppose, social and institutional license to ask that question in an MBA classroom. Because when you think about an executive MBA, especially executive MBA, you think of extremely applied, um, very, um, very focused, very business oriented and management oriented conversations. And you're saying mm -hmm. you, you open the conversation with the question of um, what makes a better human being. How do, how, how do you manage to do this in an MBA uh, environment? And what response do you get? Generally, I, you know, I feel it unproblematic, even quite innocently. So, you know, the the, the sense is, um, I get the sense that anyone doing an executive MBA not interested in personal development is doing the wrong degree. I agree. Because uh, I think an executive life is a life of... Um, contemplation and understanding of values that you care deeply about and values that you want to live out and um, and and try and you know live your executive life from a values basis otherwise you you can't reasonably be morally attuned to your actions so you know for for me to um, and maybe the the you know, we start to talk about responsible leadership, ethical leadership, mm -hmm. using an understanding that really we're talking about moral and intellectual development of a human being. Uh, and this applies to just about every human being, and more so executives, 
because they charged with so much responsibility for resources and people mm. that um, they yeah, have big, to understand what they care deeply about. Yeah, big consequential decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, uh, coming back to the beginning of our conversation, they are the people who can appreciate um, the life in, in a complex system, right? the, the, uh, the limits and the challenges of complexity. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, could I just ask one go more on, question? Go on, go on, go on. Um, so I just have to ask this question. <laughs> so what sort of response do you get? What sort of feedback do you get? Uh, how do they resonate with these ideas? And the, you know, at the first outset, people, um, you know, nod in appreciation and <laughs> understand what appear to, but then they, 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 you know, it gets harder to locate this because it's, ephemeral you know it comes and goes the sense of being and understanding of it so my initial conversations is, 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 is to set up the curiosity but i don't um, expect to fully for them to fully grasp it i'm i'm merely um trying to set unfolding an understanding of being that's festering and changing the experience of being and the honest ones really say we didn't understand the thing you said Mm, uh, fair enough. You know, into course three and four. But now it's it's starting to make sense. But it okay. sounds like you don't, Kasha, you don't shy away from disruption and scary stuff and indecisiveness. And you've chosen one of the most difficult and re most reviled philosophers of the 20th century, who's almost impenetrable in his writing. How do you get away with that? How do you do that? Well, the, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, he, uh, he is that, right? So, and uh, I make no excuses for his, um, you know, his, uh, his, the tragedies of his statements and um, irresponsible behavior. But, you know, most uh, philosophers will put down Martin Heidegger as uh, somebody who really has made the profoundest difference to our understanding of what it is to be a human being. And, uh, you know, whilst we accept that, we also accept he made some horrible mistakes. And, you know, I'd, I'd even go as far as to say it's the same with Aristotle, you know, at the time he was writing, it was quite commonplace to talk about women in quite disparaging ways and think about having people in slaves uh, as ordinary, acceptable ideas, but, you know, they lived in a different time. So I, I do... Um, make those admissions to my colleagues but, but um, plead with them to to offer um, some some you know space to let these understandings uh, work with them and then they make up their own minds as we go along and obviously one of the big things that Heidegger talks about is authenticity and your title of your book sounding the depths of leadership seven character development voyages to foster authentic leadership in the ongoing present can you summarize that in 10 seconds? <laughs> Where do you begin? How's that, how's that for a challenge, Koshik? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I thought I, I, I made progress by getting that expression, but I think Toby and, and yourself understand this all too well that, um, you know, there's a, there's a congruence that we try to achieve with education, where there's a sense of understanding unfolding in each moment uh, being in practice and, and philosophy helps us, you know, um, steward that world with language. And it, it just so happens that much of our words have acquired a, an understanding that it doesn't uh, allow that openness for us to feel this ongoing present, you know, um, we, uh, we, we far too closed in our thinking and we, I mean, scholars would call it entitative, meaning that, you know, we, we, we aren't comfortable when things are open and unfolding. But if life is anything, it is that. So I think if we can give somebody the, the, the understanding of intelligibility in those unfolding moments and how leadership is unfolding with them, and around them, 
um, and, and the role they're playing. I think it's deeply um, um, empowering in a way in which, uh, you know, they, they get less attracted to the, the narcissistic tendencies or the toxic tendencies of, you know, not listening or not hearing or not being open or not building connection. So, um, you know, I tried to, to write a book to offer a pathway to that experience um, for executives, uh, you know, who, who are living every moment with some level of mindful attentiveness. Mm. Can I sort of follow up on this, but also make it a bit broader? Um, so as you know, here we're in this interview series, um, in the work that Toby and I are doing at Cranfield, we are quite interested um, in the intersection between philosophy and practical profession and philosophy and practical education as well. Um, and, you know, doing your, the work that you've been doing at, um, in your executive MBA program, you've been at that, in that space for a long time and you've thought about it for a long time. What do you think is the role of philosophy in practical professions and practical education? Why do we need it? How does it work? Very good question, Andre. And Toby, I think some of the speakers have done an excellent job in putting out some suggestions. I'm going to build on them. Uh, I really think we, um, you know, at the core of it, I think with philosophy, we providing an understanding of being. It's like a, a guardian of reason. Those are principles that tend to hold true no matter what. You know, they, they, they some pillars you can hold on to. And I certainly think um, if we, uh, the real role of philosophy is to, is to give an understanding of, of what it is to be, right? And I think the, and what it is to be not in a passive sense, but in a, in a sense of um, striving for excellence and mastery. So, you know, philosophy's understandings was, about um, providing some sense of what it is to be and highlighting the horizons or limits of what we could reach out for. And, and if we can package those in, in bite-sized chunks for, for, for our colleagues, then I think we, we, we take them into a world where so much more is possible. Mm. You know, it, it, um, it brings about a, a depth to the discussion on ethics mm. or moral character um, or responsible, responsible leadership or, mm. you know, human excellence that you, you can't do by just sharing with them, do this practice in that circumstance, because it's just too much of that to give all off, you know, mm. it's, you want this, um, the self direction to unfold from inside. But you want them to have some navigation of, of how to go along with that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I I couldn't agree more. Um, I know Toby's dying to ask you about authenticity. Yeah, and you sound like Pashik, You're talking about self mastery. You're talking about some sort of self transcendence, which is an astonishing gift if you can give it. That is, uh, back to Andre's point mm -hmm. about license. Can you give that? What does, what does the student have to bring? Yeah, a very beautiful point, Toby. And, and you know, I think, I think we can give it. And, and um, because you must remember, the earliest civilizations had some sense of this. So, you know, the early Greeks had a word for it called pousis, where there was an understanding of living in such connection with emerging life that, um, you know, um, everything was emerging. So their language lent to that understanding. In, um, in African philosophy, we have a similar word with similar connotation called Ubuntu. You know, yes. that is a, a person, as a person through other people. And we are all the time co-creating each other in ways in which we ought to be more aware of. So the, the, you know, the, the, the gift a good education will bring 
is 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 um, is what we all too commonly call personal leadership. But actually, it's it's stewarding a life um, in the direction of being able to to build one's character and build it with others. To see human interaction is is invitations to do that, and um, and to understand that um, you know we hardly have um, closed agency to change the world on our own. We're really working in a quite an interdependent world, intersubjective world with others. And how do you work with that complexity in in humble ways, but also in with some agency and intention. And I really think that the search for one's own authenticity, if we just had more people tap into that, we would have so many more people pursuing excellence. And as a result, so many newer ways of uh, living, being, and pursuing uh, um, life. So the... Um, I mean that's the invitation of 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 the kind of work we're doing, Kobe. It's, it's to is to not give the answers, but to show this is possible. Such a relief um, to hear you say that. Such a relief. Yeah. You seem a thousand miles away from the banking metaphor, the banking system. We're going to accrue knowledge. We're going to stuff your head full of knowledge, and at some point you might draw that knowledge down. You seem you seem to be saving the people that you work with from that approach and for them to shine in some fashion. I just wonder when people say they can't do that, I'm wondering what is the response? What's the, what's the pushback that you may get from some who aren't ready for that journey? We, we generally have, um, um, well, you know, there's, there's generally the, the challenge with understanding, but um, I always see that as such an opportunity to have a dialogue and to, uh, you know, transform our understandings of, 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 of you know, um, being in the world, pursuing authenticity. And and often the question gets asked for what and for whose ends. And, uh, you know, I rigorously respond with, well, it's for a good life, you know, it's for your good life. And, mm. and hopefully goodness is, is amounting to more than just yourself in, in the benefits that accrue. And um, it doesn't take a lot of convincing because people innately want to pursue some good. And if we can just show them the way without overwhelming them with fear, um, they take the invitation. And then obviously you've got to go alongside them. So I mean, that's my, the coaching work I'm, I'm normally engaged in because some people do get stuck you know, over careers and different phases in their lives. And I often have to work with students who become stuck. And often the stuckness is, is, a, um, is them being a participant in, a, in an environment of work that's changing and not changing with them or them not um, going along with, with the purpose and value system that's there. And, you know, you have to rebuild that aim for a good life again with them. And uh, so in, in, in some sense, you know, we can do a lot with philosophy, but I think the, there is also the, the need for a small number of colleagues that would need to be coached in a more direct way. And you talk about a 21 day cycle, as I understand there's some sort of journal that the people keep and you're presumably yeah. helping them do that. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the it's, it's um, you know, it, it, it borrows on Aristotelian principles that you need habituation to settle these ideas and to, because we, the way we make up our worlds uh, is not as granular um, uh, as the, you know, the way in which we're in the world, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it misses a, lot, a large part of that. So the reflection for 21 days helps them build a very granular understanding of how they're making up their worlds, what they're prioritizing, what they're really interested in changing, where's the resistance coming from, 
And out of that um, set of data points, they can quite easily see what value system they live in and what value system seems to be a better pathway for them. And, and alongside that, what virtues they would need to build to grow that value system. So the, the you know, the, 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 the making of data happens in the 21 day cycle and we go for three 21 day cycles together. And it is just beautiful when, um, when they have a language and an experience that's congruent, you know, and, and our, what I call the three bodies coming together, it's just a beautiful sight to see. These people are just alive, and and you know you can you can cope with most things when you when you that attuned to your own life's unfolding. It doesn't sound like an executive MBA. It sounds more like a retreat. A uh, transcendent retreat. <laughs> it sounds well, amazing. Yeah, that's uh, uh, very nicely put forward. I'd like to think of it that way, uh, Toby. But I think the, we do put them through a lot of hard work, so they have to, you know, refine their ideas about strategy and leadership and business model innovation and organization design. But with the proper understanding of being in the world, with them of themselves and other people. So that ontological shift is occurring over time and, and hopefully, you know, gets to a, a heightened level of understanding and awareness towards the end of the course. Wow. Yeah, I think I, I'm listening to this. I'm thinking that probably for us, um, extending that invitation is what makes education education or what, what allows us to call our our product, so to speak, education, uh, rather than just training, for example. And yes, we, we will still teach the students to operate the, um, the Bloomberg terminal uh, or to do the Porter's <laughs> Five Forces analysis. Um, but actually to think about yourself as a decision maker and a leader and a person who is embedded in the network in the, uh, well, enmeshed really in the world, right? Embedded in the network of uh, other agents in the world and plotting your agency in that complexity and understanding the impact of that on yourself, um, it can't be done by a training consultancy. It could only be done uh, in an educational institution. I think that's what education is. It, it's transformative um, in, um, in its nature. And it has to be that way, I think. Uh, so what do the alumni say? <laughs> So you've had a fair, you've had a fair yeah, number of yeah, people who, who've gone through the program. What do they say? Well, firstly, I have to agree with you, Andre. I think that's that's a beautiful um, statement about what business we're in. Mm. We're we're in a business of of providing education and not um, edutainment or you or know, selling things that don't work or don't have a lasting effect. Uh, the, I mean, thus far we've got about close to 600 or more alumni of this wow. program and yeah. they have incredible things to say you know I'm, I'm very grateful for that level of success we've had mm. so I'm very appreciative of the good work they continue to do and um, you know they they do ask for well what's next and uh, you know that's um and how do they keep topping up and staying in contact? And so, so I'm giving some thought to that now that I'm, you know, um, uh, transitioning the directorship to another colleague. And um, I, I think we've just had beautiful stories and examples of, of leadership work. Um, and, you know, these are not heroic stories, but they stories of, of real genuine efforts to transform and transition people into more resilience or higher circumstances of health and safety or sustainability. And um, it's both in private and in public. So, you know, I don't differentiate where they do their work. Mm. Kashik, I know you, you, you integrate being, doing uh, and knowing together uh, as a form of practice. Can you differentiate those? Can you explain those to us? 
So the the being, doing, and knowing. So the the being is um, uh, probably the the hardest and probably needs definition first. It's it's a sense of us being um, aware of our existence and unfolding as time passes. So that's being a, at a you know a, a level of elementary understanding. So so doing. Um, is everything to do from talking to um, you know making commitments in language to making requests or um, you know making an intention like we would say that's doing as well because um, you know the, the doing is quite performative so understanding is partly doing in some sense too and knowing actually transitions. So, you know, you can know things, but in this world, any of our knowing is not passive. The knowing is, um, is finding its, its way into yeah. the action. It's, mm. it's performative and it's live. So, you know, whilst we differentiate it, um, yeah, there's this ongoing uh, interaction or ongoing, you know, um, processes of unfolding that they flow between. It sounds like a combination of, of Heidegger, of Dewey, possibly even Gilbert Ryle. I take it you're not expecting your students to have studied these philosophers. You do some of that for them, some pre-digestion for them? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a few of them that, that really get so um, invigorated by the writing, they go and read it themselves. But you're absolutely right, um, Toby. Heidegger is central. Aristotle is central, and Dewey is central. I mean, you just added something that I should look at. You know, <laughs> the other philosopher mentioned Gilbert Ryle. Uh, it's conceivable. Uh, it doesn't sound like mm -hmm. a philosophy standard philosophy course that maybe undergraduates take, where you learn these people. There seems to be an abiding, and I said that word again, transcendent reason for doing this one. So I'm not confusing you for for that, uh, that, uh, that approach, it just sounds like it's a very, very mature approach to some of these thinkers. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Toby. I mean, I, I do a lot of translation. So, you know, uh, even um, the work of the Chilean biologists I just mentioned, Humberto Machirana, mm -hmm. Francisco Varela, who really developed an understanding of embodied cognition, I embed their insights in a lot of the ways in which we think about language and language being a basic atom of action that arises or is designed. And a follow-on question from that point about language. Um, I'm not sure if you agree with Heidegger when he says it's not so much that we speak language or executive speaks language, but that business, organization, dare I say, capitalism speaks us. Not sure whether you have an angle on that. No, I mean, it's, um, uh, I hope it doesn't get too confusing, um, Toby, but I'll try. You're right. Um, a language is hardly innocently describing the world. It is actually creating the world. Uh, so it's a trope in some sense. And Heidegger was very um, aware of this. So, you know, it's, um, you know, we caught up in discourses in organizations and societies, and that sets the organizing trajectory for how we're thinking about things and what opportunities we think are there for action already, you know, and, um, and you know, you often have to, um, you know, it's like one simple example, you know, in South Africa's beginning of a democratic dispensation, we called ourselves a democracy. And if you were a Heideggerian philosopher, you'd say, that's far from true. You're a becoming democracy. And you're probably better off thinking and calling yourself that than a democracy at the get-go. So, you know, that's um, like organization, you know? It, it's created this understanding of a, a fixed thing. But, you know, if you, if you, if you look at an organization from a different point of view, organization is an ongoing accomplishment. Mm. 
Mm. It's emerging all the time. So we're better off talking about organizing than organization alone. You know, it could be both. It could be organization and organizing. But I think we lose a lot when we don't, um, when we haven't adjusted our language. Mm. So what is what is next for the graduate school of business? Uh, what is next for this um, MBA program? Where is it going? Well, the, the, um, you know, the brief to my colleague is we're going to try and sustain this level of excellence for uh, um, a long time and make it sustainable. But we, you know, we um, we can grow it in different ways. But we, I think we absolutely need something like a professional doctorate now because we have so many Right. students who ask well, what next you know, we've created such a unique learning experience that it's um, become fundamental that we you know we 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 offer this to more people with a masters in a general sense um that they could discover leadership and live it mm. like this for you know the benefits for themselves and others so i'm i'm thinking about that and um and it's to you know grow our collaborations like with yourselves, Andre and Toby. I mean, I'd love to um, grow our work, and I said this to Andre as well. You know, there's there's not many schools who integrate a philosophy subject in in management education. I think you you know, whilst we might be on an extreme end of this, you're quite far off yourselves. I think. And institutionally, Koshek, how, how, how is it seen institutionally where you are in the graduate school? Is it viewed with some suspicion or is it viewed as a cash cow? How is it seen? Well, I mean, in, um, um, uh, I never allowed it in my directorship to ever be seen as a cash cow because, you know, I think it's, uh, I held the line there to say in the least, you know, it was quite easily because you can't scale this level of intimacy. Mm without care you know you have to have the care alongside it so the the whole ethos of educating this people in this way is about um, inviting them on a personal transformative leadership development process with you and um, and those journeys go where they go and you know you, you have to be able to offer support nurture and encourage along the way so we you know, I, I think your school um, obviously does recognize the importance of of supporting students when you invite them into character development. Mm. And I think more and more schools are, are seeing that as important. So I, I've really kept them away from seeing this as a cash cow, but really understanding it for its transformative potential. Mm. It's interesting coming back to what you said about potentially setting up uh, a professional doctorate um, because when you were talking about your program I was thinking about the professional doctorate um, at the University of Hertfordshire that is run by Chris Moles. Um, are you familiar with that program? Um, do you... Yes, highly. I mean, he's an extraordinary, he's done extraordinary work there. It's just so are you similarly. Thinking... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, interrupted. Sorry, Andre. I mean, I'm thinking of something very similar. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, are there any parallels between what Chris has been doing there at her, in the University of Hertfordshire and what you were thinking of doing? I haven't studied it, but I will make more of a point of looking into it. It's, um, you know, we're both trying to prepare for complexity and full experience of it. Mm. And I, I know more recently, um, Scholar has had an enormous impact in my own understanding. Gary Sukas was invited by Chris sure. to address them. And, um, so I think there's definitely alignment if I just judge from the intellectual direction he's seeking. Mm. And what would you expect from a teacher of this? Ah, good question. Are, are they a special breed? Are they open-minded? I mean, how would, you, how would you even describe someone and who do teaches? Do they need a degree in philosophy? Yes. <laughs> well, look, I didn't have a, a first degree in philosophy, and I think there's probably easier ways to um, get an understanding. Well, from, as far as I know, Andre, you've got 
uh, a first degree in philosophy? No, I don't. No, um, I've got a lot of training in philosophy, but not oh, a full Toby degree. Has the first but degree. Toby, Toby does, yeah. So is that the qualification? No, I would say I would say for me as a pragmatist, somebody who's intently working on themselves qualifies to have a conversation to students about these topics. You could only go as far as you've taken yourself. Yeah, that's really well said, I think. Yeah, so if you've not got self-mastery yourself, how do you begin to help someone move in that direction? Or at least if, you don't, have, if you don't have the experience of asking those questions, yes. posing those questions to yourself yes. and grappling with them. Yeah. How can you pose those questions to your yeah. students, I think? Um, so the slightly more personal question, if I may. Um, so having done this for a long time, uh, you've done, you must have done a lot of intellectual work, uh, if only translating Heidegger for the students. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm saying it kind of tongue in cheek, but, um, but you have done a lot of intellectual work um, in terms of doing this, in terms of running this pro designing and running this program. Um, so what's on your intellectual radar screen now? Uh, what, are, what, what books are on your desk now? So, so at the moment, I'm, I'm trying to finish um, Remaking Leadership by Donna Lepkin. No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, she was a professor. She used to be a professor here in the School of Management. Yes, yes. Well, you know the quality and integrity of the person more than I do. Right? She's written about leading beautifully, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and I think you know, I'm trying to further develop that concept build it out a bit more and um, also build it out with um, adding Kierkegaard to um, my own understanding and um, is that an existentialist angle or why why Kierkegaard well it was you know he, he said something really interesting um, that um, resonates with me it's that life is not a problem to be solved it's an experience to be let in and, right. and that resonated with me completely because, you know, a lot of what we try to do is to let the full experience of life in with some composure and agency to work with it. Well, I, and, I, I just can't resist the question. Because she, so, so what's your view then on, on, his, um, on his answer to the riddle of life and uh, the, the, the primacy of faith? And the, and the uh, almost the necessity to take a leap of faith. Well, I think the, the um, um, uh, look, I mean, he's written a lot. He's tried, many people read him, you know, they, he's tried his hardest to be a good Christian and said he failed dismally to follow anything that led him. But what mm -hmm. he uh, came close to understanding is that there's a set of ideas which we call philosophy that can give you a secular spirituality. Right, exactly. You know, a spirituality that's um, rational, logical, intelligible, that deepens core spirituality that people have. And, and I think, so, so I'm, really, I'm really trying to work on those ideas at the moment. Wow. And people who are furiously trying to scribble some of these names down and don't know them, where do you go for your inspiration, aside from the names we've mentioned? Where do you get your ideas? What inspires you? So I'm, I'm an avid um, gardener and, um, you know, I'm feverishly working at myself, to be honest, you know, it, it, mm. it has been both an intellectual pursuit and a, so I, I'm a regular yoga practitioner. So on, you know, on a good week, I'm, I'm two hours on a mat doing various yoga routines and that resets restores me and I do mindfulness regularly and I um, I'm intrigued with poetry you know uh, okay any and, particular uh, kind of poetry or well the um, you know the the ones that really speak to things that I'm working with so yeah you know the um, uh, Yeats's poem on the second coming is the one that I'm, I've been contemplating uh, for a long time, looking at, you know, how um, 
we struggling for for leadership generally uh, in, in more places than we should um and then you know, i read a lot of philosophy and i write regularly so uh and I, I try to stay abreast of the management scholarship by reading, you know, people who have quite a nuanced synthesis of of, um, of the tipping points we need to transcend beyond, a bit like Donna Latkin was and mm. Harry Sukas does and Chris Moles does for sure. Mm. So I, I get inspiration by looking at questions they're raising and but you're right, you know, being at the bleeding edge is, is quite a, it's quite something to, to, to stay at because, you know, you always have to be uh, skeptical, but have some mm -hmm. faith in your ideas at the same time. And it sounds like you don't agree with the saying that we get the leaders we tolerate, or we get the leaders we deserve. We deserve better. Well, we definitely deserve better. I think, um, um, I mean, most of these toxic leadership scenarios we have, have um, we've all had them right in bigger doses than others perhaps but we um, we have to look to how the processes that we use to put these people in place you know how we how we become so um, I don't know whether we could call it tricked or allow ourselves to be snookered, but um, we generally have to look at um, the ways in which we select leadership or prepare for leadership, fundamentally. Excellent. Wow. Wow. That's made me Kushik. think. <laughs> That's made me think. Absolutely. Kashik, thank you very much for your time and for, for sharing um, the insights. Uh, we greatly enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. I did. I did too. Um, and I, I hope you did as well. Um, thank you again. I absolutely did. Thank you so much, um, Andre and Toby. I, it's, I mean, these conversations create new awareness. So I definitely walk away from here enriched. And let's trial be looked up. <laughs> absolutely. And let's keep the conversation going uh, off camera as well. Absolutely, Andre. I look forward to it. Bye thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, Kashik. Thank you.